Do not go outside. Ignore all cries for help, no matter how human they sound, shouted Alex's dad. He pulled the cellar door over and paused to look back. And lock this door behind me. The door slammed shut. Alex locked it, walked down the stairs and stood alone in the darkness, moonlight shining through a crack under the door. The basement was freezing cold. She looked around the room. Nothing but junk. Toys from her childhood. Broken furniture her dad had refused to throw away. Stacks of books and newspapers. And her grandparents' old possessions. She rummaged around and found her grandfather's recliner chair. Well, somewhere to sit, at least. She thought. Alex dragged an old bike out of the way and pushed the chair toward the middle of the floor. She searched through a chest of her grandmother's belongings. Inside were a collection of porcelain figures, some knitting needles, and a hand mirror. Alex picked it up, wiped some dirt away, and looked at her reflection. Over her right shoulder, she saw a blanket and some cushions stashed underneath an old photo album. They stank and were covered in dust, everything was, but it was better than sitting there freezing. She reclined back on the chair, wrapped the blanket around her, and tried to sleep. Alex was startled awake by something banging against the door. She pulled the blanket up towards her head and sat motionless. The banging stopped. As she was beginning to calm down, there was a gentle knock. Maybe it's just the wind she told herself. Another knock, much louder than the first. There was a knot in the pit of her stomach. She tried to stay calm and told herself over and over it was the wind, but was so unnerved she retreated toward the corner of the basement and climbed behind a glass cabinet. Hello? cried a voice. Alex's eyes widened. She crouched even further behind the cabinet. Hello? Is... Is there anybody there? Please, I... I really need somewhere to hide. The voice was faint. Alex could barely make it out. The knocking became a loud banging. Please, if anybody's down there, I need help. Alex's mind was racing. Who is this person? Why do they need help? Should I let them in, she thought. Her father's warning echoed in her mind. No matter how human they sound... What did he mean by that? Alex noticed the moonlight shining through along the bottom of the door. Maybe if I get close enough, I can see who it is, she thought. She walked slowly to the middle of the room, past the chair, and toward the stairs. Alex was so fixated on the door, she tripped on a pile of books and crashed to the ground, knocking over the bike and a stack of newspapers. The banging stopped. Hello? Is someone there? I can hear someone moving down there. Please, you have to let me in. The voice was much clearer now, but there was something peculiar about it. It sounded cold and emotionless, neither male nor female, nor young or old. Alex moved to the bottom of the stairs and eventually summoned the courage to speak. Hello? Please, yes. Hello. You have to help me. Can you let me in? Alex didn't know what to do. The voice sounded desperate, but her dad's warning was clear in her mind. She was too nervous to get any closer. Yes, I'm here, but I'm not going to open the door for you. What? Why? There's something horrible running around out here, and if you don't let me in, it'll get me. I'm in great danger. Please, open the door quickly, cried the voice. Alex felt a sense of dread overcome her. What do you mean something horrible is out there? Who are you? Look, there's no time for that now. I'm in danger now. Why won't you let me in? Won't you help me? The voice was getting angry. I won't. What? Why? Because my dad warned me not to open the door to anyone. That doesn't make any sense. Please just let me in. The banging against the door started again. What's out there? Why are you in danger? Open this damn door now! The voice growled. The banging stopped. 
and the gentle knocking started again. Alex was so scared she couldn't speak, and she didn't know what she would have said if she could. She didn't want to antagonize whoever it was outside any further. It sounded like they were furious. She looked at the crack beneath the door and had an idea. If I climb the stairs and crouch down, I'll be able to look underneath. She'd maybe be able to see the person outside and what they looked like. She climbed the stairs quietly and crouched down along the door when the knocking stopped. She froze for a moment in uncertainty before laying down and peering out. There was nothing. All she could see was the back garden. She let out a sigh of relief. Maybe they were gone. She turned to walk down the stairs when there was another loud bang against the door. Alex jumped in fright and had to grab the railing to keep herself from falling. Please, I'm begging you. Let me in. The banging continued. Catching her breath, Alex crouched down to look outside again. She still couldn't see anything. No feet, no legs, no anything. She saw nobody under the door. Yet someone was furiously banging against it and begging her to let them in. Alex fought the urge to cry. Please, I know you're there. I'm in terrible danger. How can you just sit there and not let me in? Alex faced the door and tried to regain her composure. She had an idea. As the voice continued to plea for help, she crept down the stairs and opened her grandmother's old chest. She grabbed the hand mirror and returned to the door. Please, please, please! The voice begged as the banging continued. Alex lay flat on her stomach and nervously pushed the mirror toward the door. She tilted and slid it around, trying to see as much as possible. No matter how she tried it, Alex couldn't see anyone. The pace of her breath quickened, and she began to feel a tightness in her chest. I am not opening this door. Before he left, my dad warned me not to open it for anyone. I don't know who you are, and I don't know why you're here. You shout about needing help and being in danger, but you won't explain why. But I told you there's no... And besides, I can't see you underneath the damn door. You're hiding somewhere. I can see the back garden through that slit under the door with my mirror, but I can't see you. If you just want help, then why are you hiding? She pulled the mirror back and stood up. The voice began to laugh. (laughs) You're smart to keep the door shut. Your dad was right to warn you. The voice sounded calmer this time. It was almost whispering. What do you mean? Who are you? I wasn't lying before. There is something horrible out here. You're just some maniac trying to scare me. Alex turned to walk back down the stairs. Oh, really? Put your mirror back down and have another look. Reluctantly, with a hand on the rail... Alex crouched down and peered through the crack again. Nothing. Her hand was trembling. You're still hiding. Why do you... Closer, the voice said softly. Alex got down on her front and slid toward the door, straining to see as much as she could in the mirror. She could barely keep her grip. Almost there. Pausing for a moment, Alex took a deep breath and pressed her head as close to the door as she could. Then, sounding as though it were mere inches in front of her, the voice whispered. Hello. Alex screamed in fright as the mirror was ripped from her hands and pulled away from her. She screamed again, and the voice started laughing. There was more banging, faster and with more force than ever. Alex raced back down the stairs. She crouched down behind the chair, stared at the door, and burst into tears. The banging kept getting louder. The cellar door sounded as though it was breaking apart. I'm not letting you in. Go away. Go away. Alex collapsed behind the chair. She was at the point of hysteria. She stood over the chair and took a deep breath. (laughs) What are you? The banging stopped. What difference does that make? You know I'm out here and you won't let me in. The voice sounded amused. 
Tell me what you are. It would be much easier to show you. Why not open the door and I can... No! She screamed. Tell me what you are. Tell me why I can't see you. The voice laughed and started banging on the door again. Alex climbed behind the cabinet, pulled the blanket over her head and covered her ears with her hands. She rocked back and forth until she was calm enough to lie down. The banging turned into knocking, then got fainter and fainter, then stopped completely. She tried to calm herself down and return her breathing to normal. She lay still for what felt like minutes, or maybe it was hours, in silence, not quite sure whether she was awake or asleep. There was another knock at the door, less violent than before. Alex? Alex, are you there? It was her father's voice. She crept out from behind the cabinet, looked at the door, and saw sunlight shining through. Alex, it's Dad. Alex, are you there? Please, please tell me you're all right. She leapt out from behind the furniture and looked at the stairs. Under the door, she could see the shadow of her dad standing outside. Alex let out a sigh of relief and raced up the stairs. Dad, where were you? There was something outside and it was trying to get me to open the door. Alex, honey, thank God you're safe. Come open the door. We have to get out of here now. She undid the lock and burst through the door, ready to hug her dad. She let out a cry of relief. Dad, I... Alex looked around in confusion. She couldn't see her dad anywhere. The garden was empty. Dad? Dad? She was overcome with terror. Alex ran back into the basement, slammed the door shut, and bolted the lock. She shot back down the stairs and stood, quivering in the middle of the room. She frantically looked around, making sure she was alone. Some books collapsed from the pile in front of her, and she screamed. Just some books, she thought. She tried to catch her breath. Feeling a sense of unease, Alex climbed back beneath the cabinet and pulled the blanket over her head. There was a gleeful whisper. So nice of you to let me in. If you haven't figured it out yet, we're doing something a little different for this Halloween special. What you just heard was the fictional writing of Reddit user JTB685 from the No Sleep subreddit. Performing that tale was none other than our own Addison Peacock. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, let's shout out our newest Patreon fan club members. Lenore in New Jersey, Josh Ballard, Megan Turkelson, and Tiffany Ingram. Thanks everyone for joining the fan club and supporting the show. All of them will now enjoy tons of awesome perks, including our bonus episodes of Disturbing Calls, available only to Patreon fan club members. Four bonus episodes are available right now to Patreon members. If you're curious what else is included for fan club members or you want access to those bonus episodes and much more, visit patreon.com slash disturbed podcast and join for as little as $3 a month to start receiving your benefits today. Again, that's patreon.com slash disturbed podcast. And we're not done yet. How about one more of these terrifying tales? This one features the writing of Reddit user Girl from the Crypt. Performing this tale is our own Vinny Nariani. When I went to hell, I knew exactly why. Well, Tony, shouldn't have wiped your hands on the dog, I guess. The man in the dark suit began. And if you hadn't shot those two guys back when you were 20, it would have probably done a lot in your favor, too. I know what I did, I replied. Thought so. But I have to be clear with everyone who goes down here. After all, we need to find a fitting punishment for you. Uh Uh-huh. What do you have in mind? I asked as I sat down in the office chair across from him at his gesture. Think, 
long and hard. Two mothers lost their sons thanks to you. It was self-defense. It wasn't. You didn't need to shoot them in the chest. A bullet in the knee and they would have gone down either way. They didn't have any weapons. They were coming at you, but it wasn't a fair fight. To be frank, if it was just me, I'd let it slide. You were in distress. Maybe you weren't thinking. But see, this is how we get you. And it's still two lives that were snuffed out that night. Either way, you did change your ways, didn't you? A fond smile crept its way onto my lips. When I met Maria. Yes, right. Your dear wife, Maria. A virtuous lady with a heart of gold, if there's ever been one. Yeah, Maria's great. Was. My condolences. The second these words had left his mouth, I felt my chest tighten. My heart must have stood still for a moment. Was? I repeated. You've been waiting for a long time, Tony. You didn't notice, of course, but we are really busy most of the time. You died ten years ago on the spot, so happy anniversary, I suppose. The sad thing is that in the meantime, something truly unfortunate happened to your mourning widow. Did she remarry? I inquired. No, that's not it. He slammed the folder in front of him shut, suddenly a relieved smile on his face. But this actually made me come up with a great punishment for you. He rose from his chair and held out his hand to me. I did the same and shook his offered hand. He cleared his throat. For the pain you have caused to loving people and for the lives you have taken, you shall witness the person you yourself loved most of all being wiped from the face of the earth. I swallowed hard. I couldn't think of anything I would like less than to watch my wife suffer, but he was right. It seemed adequate. I deserved it. Even more so, something deep inside of me had to know what had happened to the love of my life. A dread-filled, nervous, frightened kind of curiosity. The man in the black suit led me into a dark room with only a chair and a large screen inside. He sat me down on the chair and proceeded to strap me down into it. Once I was seated, he reached out to touch my face and pushed up my eyelids. When he let go, I noticed I was unable to squeeze them shut again. Don't worry, your eyes won't dry out, he promised. All you have to do is watch, and then I'll let you close them again. I sighed and nodded. Fair. Ready? The man produced a small remote control from his pocket. I took a deep breath and directed my eyes up at the screen, bracing myself. Yes. The man patted my shoulder and pressed a button on the remote. The screen buzzed and came flickering to life. I could hear the man leave the room and shut the door behind himself, locking it with a click. My heart was pounding in my chest as I stared up at the monitor on which an image had appeared. It displayed a familiar scene, our neighborhood, the street on which we'd lived before I'd died. It was dark and the moon hung high up in the sky, and there she was, Maria. She looked older than I remembered, but not by much, and she hadn't lost one bit of her beauty. The silvery moonlight was shining down onto her brown locks which were flowing down her slender shoulders as gracefully as ever, and tears were shimmering in her large, dark, round eyes. She quickly wiped them off with one hand, the other clutching the shopping bag she was carrying. And then it happened. As she rounded the corner, she bumped into someone. She gasped and dropped her shopping bag, spilling oranges, eggs, and a bag of flour onto the ground. A slew of apologies on her lips, she bent down to pick it all up. She hurriedly shoved the items back into her bag and stood back up, only to find herself eye to eye with the muzzle of a gun. My heart sank, and judging from the look of sheer terror on her face, so did hers. Her jaw dropped to form a surprised, horrified little oh, but it didn't last long. The man pulled the trigger just a split second later. I watched as Maria, the woman that had made my life worthwhile, who had cherished and loved me despite my past crimes, who had showed me a different side of a world that had treated me with little else but disregard at best and cruelty at worst, before the day she had stepped into my life, fell to her knees. By the time her lifeless body hit the ground, I was screaming so loud I thought my lungs could have burst. The man took out a small Polaroid camera, snapped a picture of the scene, and turned to leave. He didn't pick up her purse nor her bag. 
he simply walked off, a smile on his face, as if he was pleased at just having snuffed out the life of an innocent, unsuspecting pure soul, as if he hadn't stolen what could have been decades of healing from her loss and enjoying her time on earth from her. Tears running down my cheeks, unstopped by my frozen eyelids, I yelled at the screen, at the man, at the corpse of my wife. Finally, the lights of the moving picture faded to black and the screen turned off. I could hear the man in the black suit come in behind me. He walked up to me and loosened my restraints before gently wiping over my eyelids. They fluttered shut instantly and I blinked a few times, getting used to the feeling again as the tears kept streaming down my cheeks. I swallowed, looking up at him. Where is she? I asked breathlessly. She's in limbo. She'll go to heaven for sure, but for now, there's too much turmoil in her soul for her to find release. Send her up there now, I demanded, wiping my red swollen eyes. Not that easy, I'm afraid. It's her soul, Tony. It's inside of her, he sighed. She'll have to calm down first. It might take a while. She's dazed, confused, at complete odds with her sudden death and far from acceptance. Suddenly... He perked up like he had just had an idea. Of course, I suppose we could help things go their natural way a little. We could? How? Whatever it is, I'll do it. Anything. Hold your horses. I'll explain. There's only one thing that'll help the soul of someone who has suffered injustice at the hands of another. Do you know what that is, Tony? Forgiveness? I offered pathetically. (laughs) No. Revenge. See, there's one big advantage you have by having been sent here. And that is, once you've received your punishment, you're free to go. Well, not exactly free, but free to do as we tell you without being tortured. Noticing the disbelief on my face, he rolled his eyes. That's how it works. You come down here, we make you repent, and once we think you've had enough, we send you forth to get us some new sinners. And this guy... He's got a top spot on our list. You may have noticed that he didn't kill Maria for her money or possessions. He did it because he wanted to, and he's done it before. He enjoys it. I let out a shaky sob. The man in the black suit held out his hand to help me up. So, Tony, how about it? Are you going to avenge your dearest departed? This time, it truly would be the right thing to do. An eye for an eye. I could feel my face harden and I placed my hand in his and let him pull me to my feet. The man in the black suit guided me back to the elevator I had found myself in after awakening, the one I had descended in. We stood side by side in the small cabin when an unsettling thought came to me. How do I know you're not just screwing me over? I asked. I have absolutely no need to. All I want is for this man to be down here. He chuckled a little. Oh, the things I'm going to do to him. The things I'll make him do. His voice trailed off. And you. You want to take revenge from Maria so she can move on. We both have our motives in the open, and I swear by my good name that your maneuver will not be in vain. And your good name is? Son, I'd have to mutilate your vocal cords for you to pronounce it. He replied with a laugh. And what good is a name you can't speak out loud? Just trust me on this. I mean, it's not like you've got much of an alternative. I'll trust you then, I muttered, hoping I would not be regretting this decision anytime soon. I will give you what you need most in this world you are about to return to. A body. But that's all I have. You'll need to find a weapon and a way. But since the will is there already, I'm confident in your success. He motioned for me to turn to him, and I did, giving him a questioning look. The apartment you'll find yourself in is his. I'm not sure if he's home, but let's hope he is and you'll manage to catch him off guard. One more thing. You need to be over with it by sunrise. That's when I'll take you back here. Good luck. With that, he pressed both his palms to my temples and I felt my eyes flutter shut, only to see a set of completely new surroundings upon opening them again. I was standing in the kitchen, facing a fridge right next to a small stove. My head was spinning and I had to grab onto the counter behind me in order to stay on my feet. Looking down on myself, I recognized the clothes I was wearing. 
the same jacket and pants I had worn when I had my accident. They were even still torn in places. I could feel my own crusted blood rub against my skin from the inside of those parts that hadn't been ripped apart but should have. Still, my body was whole. Ignoring the disgusting feeling of dirty clothes and the aftertaste of my own death that hadn't seemed to have happened this long ago, I began to look around. The block of knives beside me looked promising. I grabbed a hold of the longest one and pulled it out, considering it. It certainly wouldn't be easy attacking with such a large, clumsy, makeshift weapon. But with a bit of luck and his potential surprise acting in my favor, I figured it had to do. Trying not to make any sound, I proceeded into the adjacent room. The bedroom was right next to the kitchen and they were connected by a tiny, narrow hallway. I held still to listen to any possible noises, but all was silent. The idea that he really wasn't home began to sink in. Of course, that would complicate matters a bit, but at least it gave me the time to look around. The bedroom door was already open just a crack, and it creaked when I pushed against it. Slipping inside, I found the room to be of about the same style as the kitchen, small and cramped. The sheets on the bed were folded in a neat, orderly manner that appeared weirdly at odds with the general decrepitude of the place. There was an old white closet leaning up against the wall across from the small bed, it looked beaten up, and I immediately noticed scratches in the paint. There was dust everywhere under the bed and nightstand. I could even see it from where I stood. I frowned slightly. Maria would have hated this room. I remembered the many times I saw her sweep the floors in our house, her hand on her back in uncomfort. I'd offer her to take over, and she'd let me, only to reconquer the broom saying I didn't do it right. Sweet, perfectionist Maria. Remembering the photo he took of her body, I began to go through the drawers. I was sure he was keeping a stash of them somewhere. My search came up with nothing at first, until I tripped over a tiny elevation in the ground. A loose floorboard. How original. I bent down and used my nails to dig it up before lifting it from its place. There was a yellow envelope hidden in the small space I had just uncovered, stained with dust and the marks of time and use. Its opening edges were frayed. I picked it up to take a look at it. As expected, there were photos in there. Lots of photos. I counted twelve in total. I couldn't bear to look at that of my wife, but I did pay attention to the three that followed hers. I assumed they were in some sort of chronological order. If that was the case, then the later victims had suffered a lot more at his hands. These last three hadn't been shot. They had been stabbed to death each one apparently with more ferocity than the last. It was sickening. Once I couldn't stand it any longer, I continued looking around. Needless to say, I found his laptop and decided to make use of it. He's not home yet, but it can't be long now. I know he's not expecting me. I'll wait behind the door for the bastard. He won't even see it coming. It'll be quick and clean, or at least quicker and cleaner than he would deserve after what he did to them. To her. Who knows what the man in the black suit's plans for me are for after that. Maybe I should be scared. I don't know. That's where I'm at right now, and that's all. I put the photos back into the envelope and placed it on the table, in plain sight for the cops to find when they'd come to investigate what I imagine will probably be quite a stank after a few days. I guess you guys are going to hear some about all this in the news soon. Or maybe they'll cover it up. Who knows? But if the authorities do find him, and if they do find the photos, then there'll be people out there knowing why there's a dead man's fingerprints on it. Besides, my initial demise came so quickly I couldn't even think about it too much. If I'm being honest, I went into writing this expecting it'd turn out to be some kind of goodbye letter. I guess that's just not my thing. This is alright though. This will do. This episode of Disturbed was produced by yours truly, and that electrifying, spine-tingling original score you heard was courtesy of Kevin Hartnell. Special thanks to all the contributing narrators and authors of these stories. 
You'll find all the relevant links in the show notes. And don't forget, you can submit your own story by emailing disturbedpod20 at gmail.com or through our subreddit, Disturbed Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.